Thank you, uh, Glauca. Thank you to the other organisers of uh, this course, and uh, it's, it's uh, good to see all the, the, the students here. Uh, and in a way, what I want to do over the next 35, 40 minutes, I'll try and get you to coffee as soon as possible, is to take you back a bit. You've heard about uh, making mouse models, you've heard about uh, the principles of mouse genetics, you've heard something about how we can use mouse genetics to, to dissect disease. But I want to take you, if you like, back 10, 15 years and tell you about some of the principles that have emerged in mouse phenotyping and how we're using those principles to uh, make a comprehensive catalogue of mouse gene function for every gene in the mouse genome. And in a sense, this talk that I'm giving you before coffee is a prelude to the talk that I'm going to give you after coffee. The two are interlinked and flow together of going back to basics of what do we mean by mouse phenotyping? How do we best do it? What are the challenges in mouse phenotyping? And how do we begin to apply that to create a comprehensive catalog of mammalian gene function? Uh, and from that perspective, I think it's, it's worth emphasizing, you heard from Pat yesterday <coughs> about uh, advances in phenotyping and home cage phenotyping and so on. So there's a whole technology of improving our ability to understand how a particular system, be it neurological, behavioral, metabolic, works in the mouse. But how do we bring that all together? What are the fundamental principles by which we, we make a mutation in a mouse and we then characterize that mutation? to tell us something about the overall biology of the organism. So these are the, these are the big challenges for mouse genetics uh, in the 21st century. They haven't changed over the last 10 years. There's still enormous challenges of characterizing the function of every gene in the mammalian genome, generating mutations in every gene, characterizing the phenotype of every mutant mice, and through that, as we've heard from Roger, identify new models uh, of human disease, which will give us insight both into biological mechanisms and also disease models for therapies. But here's the rub, here's the difficulty. The figure hasn't changed very much, although uh, I'll tell you about IMPC after the break, which has changed this enormously. But until a few years ago, only about 70% of the genes, sorry, only about 30% of the genes had been knocked out in the mouse genome and investigated. And for all of those mutations that have been made, the studies that have been carried out on them were patchy and incomplete. And that's largely because they were made by investigators uh, who were maybe interested in kidneys, so they only looked at the kidneys in the knockout. They didn't look at other metabolic systems, they didn't look at the neurological systems, uh, they didn't really understand all of what we call the pleiotropic effects, the multiple phenotypes that you get in a mouse when you knock out a particular gene. So what we need to move on to is broad-based phenotyping of all the knockouts for a knockout for every gene in the mouse genome. And such a project would provide us with a catalogue that would be unparalleled. And I'll tell you about how we're making that catalogue after the break. And before the break, I want to tell you about the principles that we've formed over the last 10 years to be able to do that tremendous biology, big biology project that's going to be transformative for uh, mouse genetics. <coughs> I can point out that if we do this, if we just take knockouts and we broadly base phenotype, then this is an unbiased approach. It makes no assumptions about what we think a gene might be doing. We all think we know what some genes are doing, but generally we're wrong about that. We really need unbiased approaches, which will be hypothesis generating. So how do we characterize the phenotype of any mutant mice that we make? What is the, what are the problems? What are the challenges? And that's really the first part of my talk. And I think it can be displayed in this figure, uh, which really shows the, 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 the big challenge, the enormity of the task in front of us of phenotyping mice. Because in a sense, phenotype data is part of a very huge, it goes on down through the floor right through to the other side of the earth. Uh, it's a big, huge three-dimensional matrix. On one axis, we've got all the mutants, and we could have mutants on different genetic backgrounds that reveal different phenotypes. On another axis, we've got environment, the environment that we bring up the mouse, the kind of food they have, the kind of temperature that they're held at, their light cycle, and so on. 
And then down this axis, the vertical axis, we have as many tests as we think we can apply to decipher the phenotypes in myriad uh, biological systems, all the way from the brain through to the cardiovascular system and so on and so on. And traditionally, phenotyping has been about sticking in a specific data point, a specific set of data points that we think might be interesting. But we want to fill in all of this matrix. Effectively, we want to <coughs> undertake a systems analysis. And this is the enormity of the challenge that faces us. Effectively, we want to take mutations for every gene in the mouse genome under specific environmental conditions with a whole range of tests and fill in a huge 3D matrix uh, of data. And that will really tell us how biological systems work, not just making a, a knockout, one knockout, looking at a particular tissue and then thinking that we've got some insight. So, in words, these are the challenges of phenotype discovery, characterizing disease models through a multi-systems approach. Multi-systems phenotyping means broad-based phenotyping. Without broad-based screens, we won't understand systems, biological systems. So we need efficient, primary, high-throughput testing platforms for mice that will give us that broad-based phenotype perspective of what's going wrong with a, a knockout for every gene in the mouse genome. That's the big challenge for science. So when we set out on this project, and this project was very much led in Europe, maybe 15 years ago now, we realized we needed to develop robust and broad-based comprehensive phenotyping platforms. We needed to standardize those phenotyping platforms. If, I, if you take one word away from this talk, it's about standardization. So if you think about it, we can't do all of this in one lab, in one center, be it Harwell or somewhere else. We have to do this project in most genetic centers throughout the world. And obviously, if we're going to share and compare data, we've got to standardize the way that we do all of the tests. And of course, if we're sharing and comparing data, we need appropriate informatics development to be able to describe the data that we've acquired, to exchange the data, and ultimately to disseminate it to the wider community. The importance of standardization, I can't emphasize it enough. We need Repro reproducible test outcomes. You'll have seen all of you in the literature, there's a great conversation going on about uh, how do we make sure that all of the biological data that we generate is reproducible. It'll come through standardization. Better comparability of test outcome across labs, across time, allowing us to share phenome results, phenotyping results in our databases are robust and standardized. So in Europe, over many years, we've spent a lot of time I'm going to tell you about two programs, the first, Eumorphia, where we've build, been building a European model for this to standardize tests and begin to apply those standardized phenotyping platforms to analyzing large numbers of mouse knockouts. And the first uh, program that I'm going to tell you about, amongst many European mouse programs that have been underway over the last 15 years or so, is Eumorphia for European mouse phenotyping, which was for the development and standardization of mouse phenotyping platforms. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but this briefly summarizes it. We spent five years developing a whole suite of mouse phenotyping platforms which were standardized, and we tested that standardization. That's how I'll come on to show you. We validated them across different centers in Europe. This, uh, these standardized uh, uh, phenotyping screens uh, were available in a database called Empress that was published in Nature Genetics some 10 years ago. And as I said, it led to a database of validated SFPs for phenotyping a mouse. And this was a collective effort of research centers all the way uh, around Europe, including uh, here in Italy, Monte Rotondo uh, in Rome. So I'll just give you one example of some of the things that we did. So here's one of the tests that we generated an SOP for and we standardized. It's the open field test. It's a measure of uh, locomotion in the open field. It's also a measure of anxiety by the amount of time a mouse uh, spends in the center of the field, uh, which is an anxiogenic environment as opposed to around the periphery. Normal mice tend to spend most of their time around the periphery. But the amount of time that they spend in the center 
is a measure of the degree of anxiety that that particular mutant displays. Anyway, what we did was we took various inbred strains, which have different profiles uh, uh, in the uh, open field test, and we looked at the percentage center time amongst a number of other parameters of the open field test. And as you can see, comparing them across centers, this is a relatively robust test. You can see that the order of the inbred strains is the same in the different centers. We have a standard operating procedure that works here. So this is a kind of analysis that we did as we built our suite of robust standardized phenotyping platforms. So here's a test that doesn't work. You can immediately see, looking at it, that if you look across the different centers, we look at our four mouse inbred strains and we try and compare uh, the profile of those inbred strains, how they perform on this particular test, which is a rotor rod test. Again, it's another test of locomotor ability. You put your mouse on, these, uh, spin, but it, on the spinning rod between these uh, uh, spacer discs, and you ask how long can the mice hang on as the rod is turning. And that latency to, uh, uh, to, to fall uh, was examined across all of the centers in these four inbred strains. And you can see the data is a load of rubbish, to be frank. Didn't work well at all when we started doing this. So we had to go back, re-examine the procedure, alter the SOP, make a number of changes so that we could get robustness and reproducibility between the different centers. So we made some changes, I'm not going to go into them in detail here, in, in both the design of the rotor rod and the uh, training phases and the trial phases. And here you can see uh, data that was subsequently produced across three centers, much more consistent, much more robust. So this goes on all the time now in the mass community. How do we generate a suite of phenotyping platforms that can be used in different centers at different times and still give us robust and reproducible data. So we can begin to fill in this matrix. We can begin to generate data that ultimately uh, we can use as a, an underpinning catalog uh, of biological information where we can understand the genes and genetic networks that underlie physiological systems. So the challenges of phenotyping too. Eumorphia, we'd set up our standardized phenotyping platforms and pipeline. Let's now apply it in a project uh, which began around um, 2005, 2006, I think, and it took, again took five years or so. Uh, it was a major pilot program to utilize these standardized phenotyping platforms for the analysis of a large number of mutants. And these mutants came from another uh, a European program called UCOM, it's up here, this European Conditional Mouse Mutagenesis Program, which were developing mouse mutants for most of the genes in the mouse genome. So we were making the mutants, now we have the phenotyping platforms, the phenotyping pipelines to analyze the mutants. Let's put them together, let's see how it works across centers to analyze a large number of mutants. So UCOM was part of the International Knockout Mouse Consortium that have been producing a large number of knockout embryonic stem cell lines over a number of years. And they are lines that are used both by Eumodic, and I'll tell you after uh, the coffee break, uh, by the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, IMPC as well. So they're the bread and butter of what we do. There are mutations, and I don't have a lot of time to uh, really go through the allele that was created in the embryonic stem cells, except to say it's this complex allele here, it's called TM1A, uh, which is a knockout first allele, so the TM1A is uh, in fact a, 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 a splice acceptor knockout effectively, uh, and you can either pre-modify uh, it or you can flip it, you pre-modify it, you create this null allele called TM1B, uh, but it's also conditional ready because if you flip this allele, you get a, a, an allele which uh, is ready for uh, conditional mutagenesis. If you want to hear more about this, I suggest we discuss it in the break because I could spend five or more minutes discussing the, the allele structure. But anyway, Eumodic was a major pilot program. We wanted to analyze 500 of the mutants that were created by UCOM through a standardized phenotyping pipeline, and there were four major institutes involved around Europe. So each of them were applying the same standard operating procedures for phenotyping. 
And of course, this helped us to look at issues around large scale mouse mutagenesis and phenotyping, the logistics of mouse production and phenotyping. How well did the assays work? How sensitive were they? And capture and disseminate and build on all the rich phenotyping information that we were going to get from this project. So in simple terms, this is how we did it. We took the Yukon mutations, or the Yukon ES cells, we uh, injected them into mouse blastocysts, we made knockout mice, we got heterozygotes, uh, we bred the heterozygotes to, uh, to homozygosity. Where we had viable homozygotes, the, uh, they went into this primary phenotyping pipeline, seven males and seven females for each of the knockouts. Where the homozygotes were lethal, uh, we went back to the heterozygotes and we <coughs> phenotyped the uh, heterozygotes. And there were four mouse clinics involved, Helmholtz in Munich, ICS in Strasbourg, MRC Harwell and Sanger uh, at Hingston. And this is the pipeline. In fact, it's two phenotyping pipelines. And, and uh, in fact, at one point, we raised the number of uh, animals that were going through each of the pipelines to 10 and 10. But you can see there are two pipelines with different tests covering, covering different biological systems. And overall, there are 20 phenotyping platforms, all standardized and robust, all tested out across the different centers, measuring in total over 400 phenotype parameters. And we also recorded uh, nearly 150 metadata parameters. That includes things like heating, lighting, food, uh, the actual technician who did the test, and so on and so forth. So we captured a huge amount of metadata, which is obviously very important. If you want to um, see more about and read a detailed exposition of this, go to uh, our article in Nature Genetics in 2015, Analysis of Mammalian Gene Function Through Broad-Based Phenotyping Screens Across a Consortium of Mouse Clinics. This tells you all of the detail, and it's really worth reading because there's a huge amount of analysis, which I'll only briefly give you a taster of uh, now. So if we summarize what we got in this, uh, we analyzed uh, nearly 450 mutant lines, which came from 320 genes. And all of that data was uh, entered into our database, Europhena. And just to show you the enormity of that three-dimensional matrix that we're capturing, there were nearly 10 million data points in, in this effort. Uh, there were nearly 3,000 phenotype annotations and ov over 25,000 mice were analyzed in this one project alone. We did complex Bayesian statistical analysis, particularly to control the false discovery rate of phenotypes when we analyzed all the data. And we found that of the mutant lines that we analyzed, 83% of them had at least one phenotype. And around two-thirds of them demonstrated multiple phenotype annotations. And this is very important. We clearly uncovered a lot of pleiotropy, as I come on to say. Many of the knockouts had more than one phenotype, and often in disparate tissue. That's absolutely critical. This goes back to the point that I was emphasizing before of the need, if we're going to understand biological systems, we need to know what a gene is doing, not just in one tissue, but in all tissues uh, in, in the body. Uh, if you look at uh, any the lines that had an annotation, uh, a large number of them are lethal or sub-viable, and obviously they were analyzed as heterozygous. So as I'll come back to in my talk after the break, uh, a large number of lines show embryonic lethality when they're homozygous. And of course, it's not something we did in this particular program, but subsequently in the mass community, we're looking at those lines in a lot of detail to see when does embryonic lethality occur? Why does it occur in the embryo? Because that's obviously important for understanding biological mechanisms and disease as well. So these are just a couple of graphs that are taken out of the paper. I want you to focus on this graph initially. Uh, this is the uh, distribution of phenotype annotations by zygosity. So if you look here in the lighter color bars, we've got homozygotes. In the darker bars, we've got heterozygotes. And this shows the number of lines with this number of annotations. So you can see that for many of the homozygote and heterozygote lines, there's lots of pleiotropy. You know, here are uh, genes out here which have got 40, 50, 60 phenotype annotations. So of the homozygotes, 88% of the lines were annotated. The heads are slightly less. 
and we found that homozygotes have a higher mean annotation count than heterozygotes. They're slightly more rich in phenotype. So, I don't, you obviously can't read this, it's just the heat map of all the genes that we analyzed, all the phenotype parameters that we measured. So this is, in a pictorial sense, that three-dimensional, it's obviously in 2D, but that three-dimensional matrix that I was trying to illustrate to you before. So this is all the data from those 450 mutant lines that, that we analyzed. So it's a quite extraordinary rich data. And the blues really indicate why we've got a very significant uh, phenotype here. So there are some interesting points here. I've already talked about this, uh, about the, the, the number of huge number of annotations. 65% of the lines had more than one phenotype head. And where we were analyzing lines that had already been reported before, had been analyzed to some extent before, we found significant similarities between our data and those reported in the major mouse genome database, which I'm sure uh, Michelle told you about yesterday, MGI. As an aside, phenotypic effects we often are found are often associated with body weight phenotypes. Body weight is a, as Roger has just been telling you about, is a very strong indicator that you've got other phenotypes to look for. Not unsurprising. How do we know that the data was really robust, that it was really good? Well, we analyzed a, quite a large number of lines over more than one center. We had 22 common reference lines that were analyzed in at least two centers. So we're able to compare the data from different centers for the same mutant and ask, were they concordant? And indeed, the answer is yes. There was no heterogeneity in 62% of all the parameters we measured. Of course, there's a huge number of parameters. There's relatively little discordance. So intercenter consistency was good. It really works. We can generate standardized, robust phenotyping procedures, and we can put them to work in multiple centers across the world to capture data that we can share and compare later on. Of course, there are some of the lines that we analyzed. Here's one here, this gene MYSM1, which has a lot of extreme phenotypes. And in some ways, of course, extreme phenotypes are more reproducible across uh, multiple centers than uh, genes with weaker effect sizes, which we found were less reproducibly uh, detected. So new phenotypes revealed. When we did all this work, of course, we found around half of the genes analyzed that we looked at had no prior annotation anywhere. <coughs> you could go out to PubMed, you could go to the mass genome databases, you could go into human omen. There's nothing about them at all. As I will emphasize more in my second talk, there's a huge uh, black hole out there of genetic information that we've yet to fill in. Most of the genes in both the mouse and human genomes have never been looked at in any way whatsoever or associated with disease. And we found that the genes with no prior annotations also had a high level of significant phenotypes, about 88%. So this allows us to search diverse systems for novel disease genes that have never been looked at before. And just to show you that we're getting uh, annotations across all of the uh, biological systems that we investigated, you can see that this just shows you uh, the number of uh, annotations in different biological areas. You don't, it's a bit small, you don't really need to read it. But suffice to say, of course, we have a distribution. Some systems uh, have more annotations than, than others. But also the distribution of annotations of novel genes and previously reported genes <coughs> was pretty much the same across all of these systems. And here's one of the analysis that we did in the paper. I recommend that you go to the paper to look at this figure in more detail. I've just pasted out the figure. But what we did in a number of different disease areas is that we took the various tests that would impact, say, on bone disease, there are a number of different tests, and we asked what genes, what are novel genes that have phenotypes in those areas that have never been detected before. And here's the selection of genes that come out that are all novel genes for bone phenotypes, novel genes for diabetes and obesity, novel genes for neuro and behavior, selected by the <coughs> different phenotyping platforms that impinge most relevantly on those disease areas. And I'll come back to this gene later on uh, in my second talk. Here's a gene that nobody really knew anything about called LMOD1. It is picked up by many of the phenotyping tests that underpin neurological dysfunction and behavioral dysfunction. 
a novel gene, it's highly expressed in the brain, but we didn't know anything about what it did and what it might do. So <coughs> I'll come back to that later. <coughs> but this is just to illustrate that projects like this can give us a, a huge window into both gene function, novel disease models, and novel gene function. So I'll finish up uh, in the last part of my talk by moving on from Umoda to ask about new frontiers in phenotyping, and in particular, the use of challenges, because remember that three-dimensional matrix, I don't have it up again here, but along one axis there was environment. Environment, if, if you like, is the challenge that we can put upon all our mouse mutants and ask the question, if we age a mouse, and that's what I'm going to come on to in a moment, if we age a mouse, do we see phenotypes that we don't see if we just look at the mouse in its juvenile state. If we change the foot of a mouse, just as Roger might have implied in his talk, if you put some mice on a high-fat diet, you will reveal phenotypes that you won't see if they're on a low-fat diet. If we expose the mice to environmental stressors like noise, will we see more deafness phenotypes, and so on and so forth. So one of the challenges that we've been very interested in over the last few years at Harwell, at our own institution, is aging. Can we reveal novel function about genes by aging our mass mutants and re-phenotyping when they get older? And the answer is yes. We can find a lot of very interesting new phenotypes. In fact, we can cover phenotypes for genes for which we've never seen phenotypes before by aging the mass. And of course, aging is important in the study of human disease. As Roger and others have alluded to, there's a huge burden of late onset disease. We know very little about the underlying genetics for that, and of course we've got very few treatments, all the way from diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, and so on and so forth. So if you want to know more about this particular piece of work, do go to this um, paper that was published uh, in the summer of last year from the Harwell Institute that tells you about our aging screen and the novel gene functions that were revealed by our mouse mutagenesis screen. So let me just briefly finish my talk today by telling you a little bit about that and how it reveals novelty about disease pathways and genetic networks that are highly influenced by age. So at Harwell, we set up a, an aging screen, slightly different from knockouts. We weren't generating knockouts. This was a a phenotype-driven screen using uh, ENU, and I, I guess what you yesterday you said a bit about ENU. Right, and not really in detail. Not in any detail, but all you need to know is that ENU is a very efficient mutagen. It introduces point mutations into mice. So we can mutagenize large numbers of mice. We don't know where these mutations are hit in the genome, but we can then screen those mice for phenotypes. And once we've found an interesting phenotype that's associated with a particular ENU mutant, particularly now we can sequence genomes, we can just dig down and find out what was the cause of the mutation. So it's a great way to discover novel gene function. We can screen our mutagenized mice for all sorts of phenotypes, and then when we've got an interesting new phenotype, we just go down and we find the underlying point mutation that caused that phenotype, and we've got a gene-phenotype relationship. And we can do that in aging as well. So what we did at Harwell was we set up a new ENU program. We generated large numbers of mouse pedigrees carrying uh, mutations, which we put into a whole variety uh, of, of phenotype um, uh, platforms, a, a phenotype pipeline that was repeated recurrently on the same mice as they were aged up to 18 months. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to find phenotypes that appeared early and phenotypes that only appeared late that were potential models for late onset disease. You can see some of the uh, um, uh, phenotyping that's done here for neuromuscular function, behavioral function, me metabolism, of course. And one that I'll focus on later on is for deafness. Because as you know, late onset deafness, which is known to have a major genetic uh, um, uh, component uh, it's, it's a major problem for a human society, and particular, uh, particularly an aging society. So we generated 157 pedigrees, of which we completed 134. 105 mutant lines in total were discovered. 
And of those, about a quarter, almost exactly a quarter, had late onset phenotypes. The phenotype was only seen after six months. We didn't see it early on when you'd normally phenotype a mouse. They occurred later on. And of those uh, muta mutations, uh, we've cloned 44. We've cloned many of the late onset uh, genes. And it turns out that all of the late onset genes were novel <coughs> genes. They had never been associated with that phenotype before. And so in most cases, we hadn't looked at a phenotype, but these were novel phenotypes associated with those genes. So this shows the power of this approach in revealing novel gene function involved with late onset disease. Go to the paper, yet you obviously can't uh, read through all of this, but these are 12 of those novel late onset genes. For these genes, there was either no prior functional information on these genes whatsoever, or we were assigning novel functionality to genes who had known function in other phenotypic areas. So a very powerful approach for revealing what's happening in the genome in terms of late onset disease. What are the underlying genes? If we look across the um, early and late phenotypes that we got in our screen, you can see that the late phenotypes covered all the different phenotype areas that we were interested in, some more than others. Uh, but uh, importantly, we were getting new gene information about late onset disease across all of the major biological system areas. So uh, just to go back to this, um, as I said, we generated 150 pedigrees over four years, an enormous number of mice, about 15,000 mice, all of which were screened recurrently through all of these tests. And I just want to tell you about one of them, because this is my own area of interest the genetics of deafness, what genes cause deafness, both a congenital deafness, but also what genes are responsible for making us all hard of hearing when we get older. And we've, some of us in this room were certainly beginning to experience that feeling of have, have it being difficult to have a conversation in a noisy cafe room environment. Some young people have that as well. But it's all part of a process called presbycusis, we know very little about the underlying genetics. So in our ENU pipeline, we were re-screening the mice with a variety of auditory tests. I won't go into them in detail. Recurrently at 3, 6, 9, 12 months. We found a mutation. We, uh, we found a mutant phenotype. We then found the underlying mutation by mapping and whole genome sequencing for us to identify the causative gene. And that really takes us into relating our gene to uh, the uh, overlying phenotype. So anything that, where well, we saw a phenotype at three months, we called early onset hearing loss. Anything from six months onward, we called progressive or late onset hearing loss. And these are the models that we're really interested in because they might give us, begin to give us a window of what are the genes that are causing presbycusis or late onset hearing loss. So, very briefly, as a summary, we got 26 pedigrees with a hearing loss phenotype, 18 early onset models, 8 late onset models. Overall, we have found 9 novel hearing loss genes which had never been associated with hearing loss before. Some of, uh, some of We obviously found known hearing loss genes again, it would be surprising if we hadn't. There's still some that we need to determine. But importantly, most of the late onset models had mutations in novel hearing loss genes. That was very surprising to us. It suggested to us that the genetic landscape of age-related hearing loss or presbycusis is very different to the genetics that underlies congenital or early hearing loss. And it's those new windows into the landscape of the mammalian genome, I'm going to talk more about this after the break, it's those new windows, that new understanding, by analysing large number of loci with efficient mutagenesis, highly reproducible uh, phenotyping platforms that is really going to transform uh, biomedical sciences. So, we're beginning to get somewhere with this, this matrix. You can see that through the Eumodic project, through our aging screen, we can begin to feel reasonably confident that we can go out there across the globe, bring all of the major mouse genetic centers together, to try and ultimately fill this matrix up, not just for 500 genes, but for the whole genome, 20,000 genes. Of course, in doing that, 
we have to remember this other axis here, this axis of environment and potential challenges, which may be important in eliciting critical phenotypes. I've, I've already talked about aging. But of course, there are other potential challenges. We could modify diet. We could modify the microbiome of the mice. We could see how different knockouts respond to infection or under immunological stress. We can see how phenotypes are manifested under physical stress, in how the social environment impacts upon <coughs> our phenotypes. And as Pat uh, talked about yesterday, we have technologies now in home cage monitoring to look at mutants in the home cage environment and look at how social interactions impact upon the phenotypes that are elicited by those knockouts and how the mutations themselves also impact upon social interactions. But oh, and of course, in my own area of deafness, noise. Noise is a major inducer of hearing loss. And some individuals are more susceptible to noise-induced hearing loss than others. So sensitization and challenge, of course, this is in a sense a challenge itself of how we bring uh, those other confounders, environmental challenges, to, the, to all of the work that we're doing. So I bring you back to this slide. Um, these still remain our major challenges for the uh, 21st century. But I think we now have a plan. We know how to do it. We know how to generate mutations in every gene in the mouse genome. We know how to characterize the phenotypes. We can begin to identify comprehensive models of human disease and make a comprehensive catalog uh, of mouse gene function and mammalian gene function. And after the break, I'm going to tell you about uh, the next phase of this endeavor. I'm going to tell you about the IMPC what we've done over the last five years, and what is the biology that's coming out of that big project. But for the moment, I need to thank, uh, these are all the people who worked on Eumodic. So this is basically the authorship list of the Eumodic paper. As you can see, there's a rather large number of people involved from all of these four institutions and others in Eumodic and Eumorphia who worked on it uh, over the years. And, uh, do I okay? uh, There you are. Uh, well done. That's me. Thank you. Thank you.